Hi, I'm Sigourney Weaver. I played Ripley. Hi, I'm Ridley Scott. I'm 32 years old, and I'm the director of the movie. <laughs> Funnily enough, on the way here this morning, Alan Ladd called me. You're kidding. Yeah, and he, he, he called me yesterday, so he obviously has some material. And Laddie uh, was always, is very interesting because he somehow gets his hands on some very interesting material and either develops it or otherwise. At this moment, Alan Ladd was the head of the studio of 20th Century Fox, and he was enjoying a tremendously successful run of everything, which would, you know, what leaps to mind is Star Wars, okay? And that was the first Star Wars. And so Laddie was in full glow here. I'm Ron Shusett. I'm executive producer of Alien and also co-wrote the original story with Dan O'Bannon. The title sequence took us a long time. We uh, first tried it. The first concept, I think, was bits of flesh and bone were forming the words alien. And we decided that was too gory and it was too classy for that. And I don't know who came up with the concept of the letters slowly building and generating until it said alien, but it was certainly a, a great forward for the movie. Give it a really a, a classy quality. The titles were something uh, which is always a difficult thing to do and it's always the last thing to get considered. But because I'd started talking about the marketing on this fairly early on because we figured we we're going to go out um, you know, we, we knew pretty soon where we were going to go out. We were going to go out one of the peak moments of the year, which is May. So we'd already started talking to the designers who would actually come up with a poster and came up with a beautiful logo. So then I asked them if they would then consider taking that particular logo, the alien, the word alien, and incorporating it into the front of the film. And, uh, and they said, well, what do you want? I said, well, I, somehow it, it should come off as a hieroglyphic or a readout. So you don't quite know what it is as it's coming up and being spelt out. And that's what they did. And I, it's still one of the best um, logo title cards I've ever had, you know, for any of the films I've done. Beautifully done and, and intriguing, somehow absolutely appropriate for the film. Hello, this is John Hurt. I played Kane. Well, here we are. These are, one, these are one of the shots, of course, that we're so used to at the time because of um, the other space films, you know, the uh, Star Wars, that sort of thing. But of course, they were all spanking new and things like that. And whereas one of the things that really wanted to get was the feeling of a really an old, battered old ship that had been bashing around the planets for donkey's years. So here we are inside our um, retro industrial corridors, which have fundamentally made up of remains of aircraft that we found in aircraft graveyards. Um, none of the things we could really afford, vacuum molding or presses or anything like that. And therefore a lot of this stuff was found and then assembled like sculpture and then painted and then joined together with nicely designed door architraves in polystyrene and sprayed to look like plastic. You know, I was very conscious of the set and the condition of the set as to whether it looked aged enough. And Ron Cobb designed a lot of these earth interiors. He had never worked on a movie before except a low-budget movie which Dan O'Bannon discovered him in called Dark Star that was done as Dan's thesis at film school. All these interiors were Ron Cobb's human interiors and the alien interiors were by Giger mostly. The ideas of the helmets came again late in the day. What I developed this into is I put two helmets in the back of the seats, developed some little 16 millimeter projectors that simply projected onto the helmets as if it were the, the small monitors relaying alphanumerics and conversation between the two computers. So these two computers are chatting. Well, I'm Dan O'Bannon and I wrote the film Alien. I remember that bit of corridor we're looking at. And I wrote the film Alien. I remember that bit of corridor we're looking at now. They, they built it at, at my insistence. All of the corridors they were building in the spaceship were straight. They were laid out in a grid. And I said, there are no blind corners. You need some blind corners in your, in your spaceship. And they built the thing and Ridley ended up putting the, uh, the, the hypersleep vault at the end of it. 
Very nicely handled the way when the door opens, uh, the, the little coat hanging by the door moves slightly. Little details like this where you get negative air. When that door opens, there's the negative air, which is protecting them inside from bacteria. And uh, it's all not really scientifically thought through, it's viscerally thought through, because I'm too much of a logician, that's the problem, and I have never quite bought yet into the notion of cryogenics in terms of its possibilities. I'm sure it may one day happen, but I think we're a long way off. If you think about it carefully, it doesn't make sense, but I think we uh, got away with it. And Jerry particularly helped here with a, one of the best parts of the score in the film. On that waking sequence, I really loved that. Um, somehow helped to convey everything and allay the, all the doubts and insecurities I had about how do you bring somebody around having been asleep for two years. I'm Veronica Cartwright, and I play Lambert, the navigator. Tom Scared, I play Dallas. And I'm Harry Dean Stanton, and I play Brett. All right, now th this was the lovely waking up pod scene. We've all been uh, put in suspended animation and frozen for some time. The women, we had to wear um, white surgical tape across our nipples because we were all wearing those boxer shorts, those lovely boxer shorts. And apparently they lost um, about five countries if we didn't. Um, so maybe there'll be a shot in here and you well, can actually see that we're wearing Harry tape. Or I. I think we were right there watching, weren't we, Harry? Yeah, I was thinking about pussy the whole time. Oh, yeah, I imagine you were. Still with us, Brett. Hey. So I had Gaila oh. and Carol uh, through the whole process of the pre and casting. And Gaila and Carol, well, any any companions you want, any city you go to, make sure you got Gaila oh, and Carol with I you. I couldn't agree more. Because you'll find every party in town. Absolutely. And and this was you know lodged with serious jet lag and casting sessions. So I was kind of pretty gaga through the whole process. Of well, play. that explains it. <laughs> <laughs> but we finally saw this this uh, beautiful giant walked in the room. We had a whisper about uh, saying, you've got to see this girl, Sigourney Weaver, because uh, she's doing a lot of theater and she's getting important on Broadway and uh, you better see her. And Hardly. <laughs> had a whisper about uh, saying, you've got to see this girl, Sigourney Weaver, because uh, She's doing a lot of theater and she's getting important on Broadway and uh, you better see her. And Hardly. <laughs> yeah, but I was thinking, oh God, we got a real thespian here. I thought so. <laughs> so in she walked and I thought, oh, that's it. I thought so. <laughs> so in she walked and I thought, oh, that's it. That's it. That's it. It was that simple. Before You're you, kidding yeah, yeah, before, before I opened my before mouth. Before you spoke, right? There you go. So sweet of you. <laughs> sure. And I was wearing my hooker boots, so that, that right. helped. <laughs> well, that helped a lot, yeah. <laughs> and then we did that, did the exchange. I think there was a bit of reading. Then at one stage, we decided to all have dinner in, in a Japanese restaurant. Yes, that's right. Which I think 55th you Street or something. Which you yeah. suggested, OK. I think it was to meet yeah. Walter and David. Right. And Bodie yeah. Boatwright or something like hey, Bodie. that. Hey, yeah. Bodie. There you go. And we were real close to production by now. Yes. We were in full ball production. I mean, in terms of building and... Cause so we you were desperate to find her. It, absolutely. <laughs> but we were on... But now, no, I was very, very meticulous about casting, always. Because mm. I figure if you cast right, from a director's point of view, mm -hmm. if you cast right, at least 50% of your problems are over mm -hmm. on the day yeah. because, you know, there's a lot to do. And I cast, I, I lay still painful on casting, yeah. Yeah. long time on casting. So eventually they were getting uneasy thinking. I didn't really know what I was doing. By then I'd done 2,000 commercials, I'd done The Duelist, I'd done, mm -hmm. you know, and I was kind of bemused by that, mm -hmm. basically saying, thinking mm -hmm. back off, mm -hmm. okay? Because so, when you see it, you see it, mm -hmm. and there, it, there she was, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then Laddie said, "You got a test." 
I said, no. Laddie, we're shooting in 10 days or something. Yeah. And he said, I don't care, you got a test. I'm not sure, because Laddie's like that, very cautious. So we tested, and the test could have been almost cut into the movie. Well, I was so grateful because you built a whole set. We did a run-through of the movie, which as an actor, mm. especially if I was going to play the part, I really needed. And uh, it gave us a chance to work together. And and I was I really thought going over there that I might be like standing next to a potted palm going <gasps> like that. And uh, <laughs> so I was so grateful yeah. for the day. It was a fabulous day. Yeah. So then Laddie saw it. I put it together, I even put a little bit of sound on it, I think. So I ran it for Laddie in it, wherever it was. And then he said, hmm. And then he said, uh, I'm going to run it again. Choose half a dozen gals from the office. He chose girls. And uh, half a dozen women gals came in, probably PAs, secretaries, assistants, a couple of executives. We ran it again. And uh, Laddie said, so, what do you think? And, um, and uh, one girl suddenly said, uh, she said, come on, don't be shy. One girl said, well, I think, excuse me, you're gonna, you don't mind, I'm just going to say it. Of course. Right? Right. One girl said, I think she's like Jane Fonda. Right? <laughs> then another one said, I think she's like, and there's, there's four or five ex extremely uh, complimentary things came out with cross-references to other stars. So he said, okay, okay, all right, good, you got it. And that was it. Oh, that's great. I didn't really know the story. I thought he yeah. said, do you like this woman? And yeah. they went, yeah, she's okay. <laughs> yeah, but he's... Uh, well, that's that's shrewd, I think, uh, very, to ask women, you know, because it's become yeah. such an important I film thought, for women. Yeah. John Finch had been cast as Kane, and on the very first day in the bridge, which we're about to come to, the scene that we're about to come to is the first time on the bridge, apart from the tracking shot. I did the tracking shot first. And I noticed that he started to look extremely, didn't look well. I didn't ask him. I thought he was just naturally pale that day. We got into, I think, the first slate and uh, did uh, action and then cut and went over to him and said, do you feel all right? He said, no, I feel terrible. And he said, in fact, I really feel bad. And so we got the medic there. They had to lift him out of the seat and carry him to a dressing room where he was checked out and taken to hospital to find he had an extreme case of diabetes. And uh, that's, in fact, was the last of John Finch for the alien. And uh, I had to literally reconvene at lunchtime thinking about who we might. He was at, at the studio the next morning. Well, I think Ridley was, you know, uh, very trusting. We might. He was at, at the studio the next morning. We all hear that line. Well, I think Ridley was, you know, uh, very trusting. He was very happy with the cast that he'd got, I think, and he tended to leave you to yourselves. Uh, he'd set up several cameras. I mean, of the scenes that we come to later in this, I'll tell you. But uh, he was very happy with the cast that he'd got, I think, and he tended to leave you to yourselves. Uh, he'd set up several cameras. I mean, of the scenes that we come to later in this, I'll tell you. But... Um, he trusted us well. He'd set up, uh, he, he'd love to get impromptu moments. And he did that by having more than one camera working pretty well all the time. Uh, so he had angles well covered and things that he, that would have a documentary feel to it in a sense, you know. What was the uh, position? Six, five, the difference zero. from the original cut is probably just over 12 minutes, 12 and a half minutes of material that hasn't really been seen before. The reason why it was taken out was basically about story dynamics and uh, there's a certain point when you have the story and therefore the dynamics, particularly on a film like this, which is fundamentally a thriller, really moving at the impetus it was going, you suddenly didn't want to have something or scene where it took a minute out or two minutes out to basically, you know, work against that impetus and so that's why it, the new stuff that you see ended up back in the editing rooms, not going into the film. But it's quite interesting to revisit this after all these years to see maybe I should have left it in. <laughs> well, I understand that I was uh, intended to be 
in the film originally, but I was uh, at that time was not available, and I was going to be doing a film in South Africa. But I wasn't allowed to go to South Africa, and then of course we had to try and find out what the reason was. It turned out in the end that I, I was the editor of Alien. Goldsmith wrote such a great score for this film, which is a bone of contention between the two of us, because I think he's uh, a genius, but uh, we didn't agree on everything. I put temp music in the film before we get the composer on because of screenings we have to have and previews. And I went out of my way to temp it with Jerry Goldsmith because I knew he was going to do the score. And one of the sections, the air shafts, I used his music from the film Freud that he did, which they liked better than what we finished up by getting from him for this film, which upset him terribly. And the end of the film, which is Howard Hansen's Symphony No. 2, was so perfect for it. It just did something that Jerry's end titles didn't achieve, even though it was good. It just didn't give us that emotional content. The experts are saying there is no atmosphere. I said there is in this film. Otherwise, my model looked like not good. And this is waggling seats. Well, I've got a guy crouched down there wobbling the seats, which is driving everyone crazy, and you get an eyeball rolling. And um, you just got to stick to your guns. Out of like more wobbling, out of like impossible shuddering and shaking, but we weren't designed for that. Every step you make, everybody's doubting Thomas, you know. But that's where you got to earn your way. But I just wonder how many people fall by the wayside because they can't push their point home and therefore don't quite get what they want. Nobody respects you later for having been a nice guy and given up. You gotta get it, you have to get it now because you're gonna wear what you got, basically. Uh, you can be very unpopular on the route, but if you're right, all is forgiven. Now this sequence here, when the, uh, the spaceship is landing on the planetoid. This is one of the, the uh, scenes in the movie that came the closest to the way that I imagined it when I was writing it. In science fiction movies up to that time, when a spaceship landed on a planet, it was usually depicted as a pretty effortless endeavor. The ship would float down from space and boop, it would land. When I came to write this, I started thinking about the times that I'd been a passenger on a big airliner when they were landing and taking off, particularly during turbulence, and the way that the, the aircraft would groan and rattle and twist and, 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 you know, and bump and clatter. And I thought that it would be really a novel and, you know, an, an interesting effect if you could show that landing through the atmosphere to be a horrendous and dangerous process where you didn't really know if maybe the ship would be torn apart before it ever made it to the surface of the planet. And... When I saw the film, the sequence as it is in the movie now with the Nostromo coming down through that dense atmosphere and wrenching and groaning and crashing was really just very close to what I had imagined. I was very gratified by that. And again, we started to get a full use of what they had in those days was scissor rocks which are basically lightning effects, which drove the Sandman crazy, because you, it basically means you're bringing two arcs together and they splutter. So that's scissor arcs going in the background. <laughs> these two are really funny. They're very real, these two, I thought were great. Like two guys on an oil rig, you know? That's, a, again, a model with an insert of a, a teeny back projection screen about a foot and a half by maybe six inches and I'd photographed them on 16 and projected it on the screen, interlocked and photographed it. Pretty primitive. Today, that would be a snap. You wouldn't even think about it. But again, coming back, having them in the window gives you the size of the craft. You can see that the only thing left on at night in the craft is the little, the nose light, the bay window in the control room. I mean, you gotta admit, Ridley is a master of atmosphere. And when it comes to texturing a scene, texture, mood, subtlety of, of mood and feeling and atmosphere, he really is superb. I mean, without it, it would have been a much lesser picture. When you're doing a, 
a scary movie, a horror story, a suspense movie, naturally plot is important, it's vital, but so is atmosphere. And a horror movie that is not atmospheric is not a pleasing thing to watch. And an, an alien needed it, and, and he provided it. And again, the low-key performances give it a kind of um, reality, I think. Um, this is business as usual. They have to do it. they got to go in. She has a certain amount of trepidation, a little anxiety. Ash is obviously a scientist who is rather be tramping around a, an, a you know unfriendly landscape than uh, going back to Earth. So he's obviously got something going on there. Not that you know anything like that other than you're registering his enthusiasm. First strange look at Ash. I was like those blisters at the bottom of Blenheim or Bomber, Wellington Bomber, and that's where he put him in his own blister. That little funny little jog is a clue. Maybe all robots get stiff. So he's not, he, whilst he's not a robot, he's a kind of humanoid, biomechanoid, you know, he's a replicant, basically. Half human, two thirds human. Okay, here we are on these things that had never been tried before, and I remember I damn near suffocated. <laughs> <in it. laughs> These were the headgear. It was like football gear, but yeah. it weighed about 75 pounds. Yeah, and there was and they told us they were going to put an oxygen in a little air hole thing in it. Yeah. And instead what would happen was the C2 canisters would mm -hmm. leak, and we'd see these lovely little swirls of smoke, and we'd go, I don't know, I'm, I'm seeing smoke in here. That's impossible, just impossible. And then when we had to lug John across the desert, and then take him up, and we had these hockey gloves that had so much paint on them, they wouldn't move. We didn't have any sound, we had no air, and I start to pass out, and you're waving your arms up there oh. going, <laughs> and uh -huh. I'm like, yeah, and, I and we're to, like 24 no, feet up in too. the air. John Hurt, he had to have an oxygen tank every yeah. time he went out on this thing. And there, there was a moment when the plumes that were on our, you know, that uh, were done with a sort of aerosol can, um, came out of the uh, the top of the thing, you'll see them shortly. They were actually leaking into our helmets. They said that they, you know, the helmets couldn't leak, but there was a, there was a tube in it which uh, had to bend slightly, and it broke, and um, Veronica and I nearly fainted because the aerosol was getting into the, which is quite poisonous, <laughs> into the helmet itself. No, 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 that's not possible, they said. But it was, I can assure you. My most useful special effect in the corridors became dry ice in the tube. And um, the problem is when you run it for any length of time, it sucks the oxygen out of the air. So at the end of a take, you start to get out of breath. We were assured it was entirely safe. So I said, OK, let's use them. What's the matter? Rocks which were smooth and weather-worn. I always loved the spacesuits. I think they're great. And they, uh, we had a big problem with the space helmets because once you're inside that helmet, just your body heat and body temperature starts to send up the temperature inside the helmet. And therefore, you either form condensation or you get short of breath and then you get panicked because you've got no breath and some people are claustrophobic and some people aren't. There was a moment when the plumes that were, on our, you know, that, uh, were done with a sort of aerosol can um, came out of the, uh, at the top of the thing, you'll see them shortly. They were actually leaking into our helmets. They said that they, you know, the helmets couldn't leak, but there was a, there was a tube in it which uh, had to bend slightly and it broke. And um, Veronica and I nearly fainted because the aerosol was getting into the... But, you know, we didn't have the technology and money to run airlines into those suits and into the helmets like you do today, like, you know, I think Jim could design his own helmet on the abyss f 12 years later. And the, tr the problem is when you run it for any length of time, it sucks the oxygen out of the air. So at the end of a take, you start to get out of breath. You'd think we could do that in those days. No, it wasn't. We couldn't afford it. Your real investment here is in the, you know, in the, for hardware is in the suits, which are beautiful. So I had a little clump of rocks. I just kept circling the rocks until I was ready to go 
that's a, that's the clump of rocks with that light over there in the background filled with smoke it looks real to me on the big screen particularly Look how beautiful it is. Yeah. You see, all that stuff is one pass done with artwork and um, simplicity in terms of your effects. This was done because I had to do it, because the set was not very good. The set was only a foot high. These rocks were yeah. about a foot and a half high. And I walked in Bray, and I hadn't had time to go and see it. Saw the set and went, oh, God. And we just stood there. You know, what necessity is really, yes. really the mother of invention. Yeah. And I sat there staring at it, thinking, what the heck are you going to do? Because Peter Voise's sculpture was beautiful. Uh -huh. And I said, has anyone got a, and I think it must have been very early tape camera. Who's got a tape camera? I said, well, I've got one at home. Go get it. So what I did is I knew I couldn't film it. First of all, I couldn't get a camera, a Panaflex down that low, which weighs 65 pounds. So, and move around like, you know, handheld camera. So I simply got a domestic tape camera and walk through the set like this, putting that in the background, then put it back through a TV monitor and filmed off the monitor. So that's why somehow it looks high tech and suddenly has this massive scale. And that was because I had to do it. Well, it's There's no choice. It's fantastic. Yeah. Because also that the fact that it keeps going in and out makes you so frightened sure. that they won't be able to see something. And the great sounds of you, you guys into talking back talk back, talk back, which also makes it a little bit more fraught and yeah. tense. And his frustration about only getting half a transmission. I think, what the heck are you gonna do? Because Peter Voise's sculpture was beautiful. Uh -huh. And I said, has anyone got a, and I think it must have been very early tape camera. Who's got a tape camera? I said, well, I've got one at home, go get it. So. What I did is I knew I couldn't film it. First of all, I couldn't get a camera, a Panaflex down that low, which weighs 65 pounds. So, and move around like, you know, handheld camera. So I simply got a domestic tape camera and walked through the set like this, putting that in the background, then put it back through a TV monitor and filmed off the monitor. So that's why somehow it looks high. Very well, this is a great shot here. Les Dilly's set of Giga's sculptural models and drawings but you know you see how well that's done that could easily have been very very corny but there's something very organic and interesting unique actually about it i still think it's probably one of the better of the sci-fi genre beast movies the lights on the helmets help tremendously because you get nice flare so half the time it's what you think you see I again get this all really. If you'd shot this clean, it would have looked like a set. But we have the flare, which helps a lot. Now it was really awkward walking. What? Oh, it really was. Yeah. Those moon boots. We had moon boots on. We were trying to look so cool walking around in there, ready we were to fall. Sweating like pigs. <laughs> 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 and those those masks kept fogging up. Remember how they'd fog up oh, and you yeah. couldn't even see John oh, half the time. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't get, yeah. they didn't have the fog thing worked out, huh? No, but they'd forgotten we, to put any uh, escape. We can, get, we can send men to the moon and we can't even figure out a simple thing like that. Yeah. And see those hockey gloves? They were really hard to manipulate. Ridley, when he sh shot the film, was he went to a great deal of trouble to create a lighting situation which would duplicate the look of uh, Giger's paintings. One of the things he did, for example, was to fill the, uh, the entire set with a uh, dense but uniform smoke. And he made sure that... Suits. so cool walking around in there, ready to fall. sweating like right pigs. <laughs> 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 and those, those masks kept fogging up. Remember how they'd fog up oh, and you yeah. couldn't even see John oh. half the time? Boy. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't get, yeah. they didn't have the fog thing worked out, huh? 
No, but they'd forgotten to put any uh, we escape. Can go, we can send men to the moon, and we can't even figure out a simple thing like that. Yeah. And see those hockey gloves? They were really hard to manipulate. Ridley, when he sh shot the film, was he went to a great deal of trouble to create a lighting situation which would duplicate the look of uh, Giger's paintings. One of the things he did, for example, was to fill the, uh, the entire set with a uh, dense but uniform smoke. And he made sure that that smoke was uniformly distributed. He didn't want billowing clouds. What he wanted was atmosphere, was a thickness of the air. He had people walking around with, with um, incense burners, filling the stage with smoke, and then he personally walked around through the soundstage with a big piece of cardboard waving it and waving it. And uh, I couldn't quite figure out what he was doing, but he didn't shoot until the fog was uniformly distributed throughout the entire set, gotten but a fraction of the value of Giger's designs from all of that. Yes, Giger was, um, it was kind of bleakly fascinating with his skulls on the top of his four poster beds and so on. And he was always dressed in black, as was his girlfriend, uh, which at that time was uh, more unusual than it is now. In fact, there are only three people I knew who were always dressed in black, and that was Harold Pinter, Giger, and his girlfriend. And my father, but then he was a clergyman. I think the space jockey is actually somehow the pilot and he's part of a military operation, if that's the word you want to apply to his world. And therefore, this is probably some kind of carrier, a weapon carrier, a biological or biomechanoid carrier of uh, lethal eggs, inside of which are these uh, small creatures that will actually fundamentally integrate in a very aggressive way into any society or any place it's dropped. So if you land on a human being, you'll have a, a resemblance to a human being. If it dropped on an ostrich... And my father, but then he was a clergyman. I think the space jockey is actually somehow the pilot, and he's part of a military operation, if that's the word you want to apply to his world. And therefore, this is probably some kind of carrier, a weapon carrier, a biological or biomechanoid carrier of uh, lethal eggs, inside of which are these uh, small creatures that will actually fundamentally integrate in a very aggressive way into any society or any place it's dropped. So if you stops, backs up, and feels the grub is there, let's say the equivalent of eight feet below you, and goes up on its hind legs, produces a needle from beneath its, between its legs, and drills through the bark and bullseyes right into the grub and lays its seed so that the grub becomes the host of the insect. And now does what comes out of the union of the grub and, the, and that particular insect, does that become a version of both? And that's what we basically you know, went along with. The man running the laser beams at this particular moment who had been doing rock shows and experimenting with laser beams was Anton First, who later became an art director and actually did films such as Batman. And um, Anton was uh, was great to work with, with his very small team. And I was absolutely, literally blown away by the effect of these beams because, you know, we hadn't seen it before, really. And I thought this would be very useful to me to create this skin, like a protection... See the drops going upwards? They're all going up. That's because the egg's upside down. And then those are my hands in the middle and a pair of rubber gloves doing the old flutter as the light comes up. Effect of these beams, because you know, we hadn't seen it before really. And I thought this would be very useful to me to create this skin, like a protection. That's strong.
This is always a great moment. And I used actually here real organic material. This is, was delivered every morning from an abattoir with steamed cattle and sheep parts from the slaughterhouse. And that lacy stuff, in fact, is called Nottingham lace. In fact, is the lining of a people, some people eat it, of a cow's stomach. And the hose that comes out, in fact, is an intestine of a sheep, which they use to make sausages. I use it because it's diaphanous. So to actually put a airline on it, it just behaves like that. It just whips. And um, that was all discovered on the day. I'm over here in LA, Giger's over there in Switzerland. We're communicating on the phone. 20th Century Fox has finally sent him some money to get started. And I sat down and I wrote out some very simple parameters for what I wanted him to start designing. And um, I described in the simplest terms what the facehugger was to do. That it was to be a small, sort of octopus-like thing that would leap onto a person's face wrap its tentacles around behind the person's head, and then it would have an organ, an ovipositor, which it would shove down the person's throat. And a few weeks later, Giger mailed these large photographic transparencies to us at Fox. They came through customs, who didn't understand what they were and were alarmed, and we had to personally go down to LAX and pick these things up. And I finally got these photographs that Giger had made of the designs he had done for the face hugger and I held them up to the light where I could see them. I was stunned at what I saw. There was the lobed creature attached to the face of a person, but instead of tentacles there were fingers. Fingers. As soon as I saw those fingers, I knew that I would do whatever I was the lobed creature attached to the face of a person. But instead of tentacles, there were fingers. Fingers. As soon as I saw those fingers, I knew that I would do whatever I had to do to get those fingers into the film. So I thought that the facehugger deserved to be given a great deal of our attention. I thought it was a very important element in the story, and nobody seemed to be finding the time for it. Giger's energies at that point were going into sculpting, the full-sized alien, the life-size one, the one which was man-shaped. And the facehugger wasn't being designed. Oh, this is an additional scene we didn't have in the film. Creature attached to the face of a person, but instead of tentacles, there were fingers. Fingers. As soon as I saw those fingers, I knew that I would do whatever I had to do, something like that. I said, okay. I said, if it looks like that, you'll be happy. I said, yeah. So, I personally designed the facehugger. I went over to the art department where Ron Cobb and everybody else were slaving on designing everything. And I uh, set myself up at a drawing board. I put a great big piece of paper down. The first thing I did was I drew a front and side outline of a human head to start with. And then I began to draw the alien over that. I drew it side view, back view, and inside view. And first I drew a basic lobe shape to fit where it had to fit over the face. Then I took the paintings, that, the very first paintings that Giger had done a year before, which was the face hugger with those fingers. And with the greatest of care, I drew fingers onto the thing copying his exactly. I mean, I had artistic training, so I could, I could do this. I could, I could copy carefully. So I got those fingers in. Then I went to the inner view, the part of the creature which would be pressed to the face, and I took the pearly-looking organic shape that Ridley had liked, and I very carefully sketched the, the soft underbelly of the uh, alien so that Ridley had what he wanted. And then I looked at it and the body of the thing still needed something. And the point at which the fingers attached to the body of the thing, I wasn't satisfied with. 
So I turned to Ron Cobb, who was right there. I said, Ron, I said, can you help me out here? Just take a look. See how these fingers attach to the sides of the, the body of the thing? I say these fingers would continue into the body. There would be some kind of skeletal understructure under the skin. Would, would you please sketch in how these fingers would connect to the skeletal understructure as it disappears into the body of the thing? Because Cobb is, is a genius at that kind of thing. And he took a pencil and he looked at it for a minute and he said, well, let's see. If those fingers attached here, then they would probably continue on into the body. There would be a skeletal understructure like this. And uh, over the space of a few minutes, he then sketched the internal skeleton of the thing. And it worked. It looked right. I said, okay, that now looks plausible. The fingers have a biologically realistic basis in the way they fit into the thing. And so then I finished the drawing. I rendered it very, very carefully. And I uh, detached the thing from the drawing table and I went walking over to find Ridley. I finally found Ridley. And I held the drawing up in front of him. I said, okay, face hugger. And he looked at it and he said, yes, good, that's fine. I said, this, this is good? He said, yeah. I said, good. And I took this thing and I delivered it over to the sculptors. I said, here is the design for the face hugger. Do it like this. And uh, a few days down the line, they came up with a sculpture of the thing, sculpted in clay. They then took a cast of that and they made uh, a mold of it in foam rubber. And it hasn't been painted yet. It was simply the color of the foam rubber, which was a kind of the color of a minimal envelope which was close to the color of human skin, and I looked at it, and up to that point I had been thinking of the alien as having a sort of a lizard-like color, a dark greenish quality. But I looked at this face hugger there, and it was the color of human skin. And I said, you know what? I said, I have never seen a space alien which is the color of human skin. I said, doing this is not only novel, it gives it added plausibility. And I said that to Ridley when he looked at the thing. By then they had inserted a wire armature inside the thing so that you could stand it up and wrap its fingers around something. And there it was, the face hugger, the color of human skin. I said, why don't we not paint it? I said, why don't we leave it like that, skin color? And again Ridley liked it, and he went for it. Okay. Try it. I just went for the script. The script appealed to me in all the elements in graphic design and the sets started to come together in my head because I'm a designer anyway so I was able to storyboard the whole movie and um, at that moment the movie was 4.6 I went back to London having said I'll do the film and I storyboarded extensively and by doing that you know you're working I find storyboarding is interesting because it actually helps you think on paper and it makes you really pin down in your head exactly what you're gonna do you start to see the scene from that we kind of doubled the budget which just shows the power of the old storyboard because they suddenly start to see things in there was a lot more here than I think just um, six people in the old dark house I always liked the wardrobe in the film I thought it was really well done and whilst Giga designed the um, spacesuits um, to largely, ex large extent he did that and then it was carried out by John Mullo um, then John did also all the other this the pale blue and the badges and the every the badges were designed and the um, you know the uh, broken down slightly worn out view of the uniforms and the, I thought it was pretty good kind of layered and interesting found a real flight suit for Sigoni, so I couldn't do any better than that because those flight suits in those days were kind of new from high-flying jet pilots. I always thought, wow, they're great. I didn't quite know what all the laces did, but they were kind of sexy. So that's what she got. Did you want something? Yeah. But John designed all the badges, the prints, the, the, the patches were all printed. and Not printed, actually, they're stitched. Just holding, not changing. And, uh, I wish I'd kept some of these things, but I didn't. Yeah. One never does at the time. The symbol above the monitor at the back, which is the wings, is actually taken from Egyptian um, temple. And a lot of the 
elements architecture in here if you look around are rather Egyptian the shot of somebody in a room or where you get a shot on their back is vulnerable so people get very tense you could start to acknowledge the the signals and symbols which are almost like maybe it's something primordial that uh, because we were all fundamentally born as hunters and therefore there's those little elements that of um, the basics that you can start to play with and make people paranoid, uneasy, fearful. I think it's getting progressively more hard to do because mainly because there's so many, such an abundance of hardcore thrillers and every conceivable kind of creature and, and uh, it's starting to get used up until somebody comes along with something unique. I haven't seen anything unique for a while. It tends to be more of the same. I think that's probably why I haven't tried to do another science fiction since Blade Runner because I haven't really come across anything that really had the story. It's all about the story and then the characters. If you've got the story, the chances are you've got the characters. Then what happens after that, the art direction, it becomes relatively easy with the right people. And you can see how seriously Ian Holm, a great Shakespearean actor already, admired for his blunden stage work, you could see how into it and how seriously they took not doing this by camp. And I'll tell you, that happened within a first few... Hence, you could start to acknowledge the, the signals and symbols which are almost like maybe it's something primordial that uh, because we were all fundamentally born as hunters and therefore there's those little elements that, of um, the basics that you can start to play with and make people paranoid, uneasy, fearful. I think it's getting progressive. Me, by the dailies, we were all looking at this stuff. And it was working so great. If they ever thought, oh, I'm doing this as a paying job, this is going to be stupid, but really so brilliant, it'll look good, and it'll be kind of dumb or modest little thing, and they'll say a little sleeper, but silly. I'd say by the third week, all of us all felt this would be an all time great classic film. Interesting. We made up this set because I said, Captain must want to go somewhere just to get away from everyone. So I figured the logic would be he goes and hides in this one of the shuttles just to get away from everyone and play something very normal like that was, I think, Mozart. I always thought this was really a beautiful, very successful set that we always wanted to be circular. And it always cost more money because everything circular is more expensive. Um, but it paid off. I think it was absolutely great. It's almost like it's be positioned beneath the the infirmary is beneath the kitchen. This will be a multi-deck ship, probably four or five decks. It's like if you're trying to lay a floor in your house and you've got a circular room, your use of tile is going to be more expensive than straight edges. So if you apply that to a big set, you've got a similar thing. You've got a high percentage of waste. Halfway through the film, you're starting to get a bit weary of, um, oh, God, another scary scene. How do we deal with this? Because nothing really happens. So now you resort to one or two tricks. And when I talked about going on people's back view or putting the camera in a funny corner position where you begin to wonder, is that the alien? Uh, what has happened to it? Where has it gone? You know what it looks like, but you don't know where it is. That's a cheap gag, but it makes everyone leap out of their skin. Yeah, sometimes you keep these things going long enough, you get the tension really builds up with very little. Again, playing the silence is interesting because silence, oddly enough, tells you something's going to happen. You don't know who it's going to, who's going to get it. But I think at this moment you think this has gone too long. It's too quiet. Is it him? That's one of those first times I sat through a picture I was involved with where it scared the hell out of me. So, so I mean, I, you know, I saw all this stuff going on when we were shooting it, but uh, the magic of how Ridley shoots and the timing of this, you know, it's uh -huh. the slow and you take the time to get every little slow move in. When you see this out of context and are able to examine it, that always gave everyone a big bump. And funny enough, I was always uncomfortable about that. Um, but uh, I think by now we had them. 
I always remember the producer saying, oh. "Don't worry, you've got him. You've had, you've got him now." <laughs> Here we have the visit from the uh, fish mongers. Producer saying, oh, "Don't worry, you've got them. You've had, you've got them now." <laughs> well, we've got to have a look at this. Here we have the visit from the uh, fish mongers, where we use the real thing, basically carefully positioned with tweezers. That's a big oyster. Um, into a case which is actually made of um, plastic. There you go. See, he's just lifting up the edge of the oyster. These were the tricks that we used in our efforts to come up with a space creature which, on the one hand, looked completely different than anything you'd ever seen before, but on the other hand, looked absolutely like something that was alive and made of real flesh, and on the third hand, is terrifying to look at. And I believe that we succeeded, and I am, I am pleased with that. You see, there's the value of novelty. If it's new and you haven't seen it before, it has impact. Once something... Be Here we have the visit from the uh, fish mongers, where we use the real thing, basically carefully positioned with tweezers. That's a big oyster. Um, into a case which is actually made of um, plastic. There you go. See, he's just lifting up the edge of the oyster. These were the tricks that we used in our efforts to come up with a space creature had when the picture first came out, because they've seen it all before. But at the time, there was a lot in Alien that was entirely new to an audience, and the impact that it had was considerable. And it was even received well by the critical community. Because in those days, science fiction films were very much looked down upon by movie critics. And they liked it. I mean, really, this is the only horror film, if you can call it that, I've done. The thing that really, at that moment, nailed me to the wall was Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I haven't seen that in recent years, so I don't know how it would play, whether it is what it is, whether it stands up. But at the time, it was so shocking. They went to places that no one had actually gone, and you think, my God, he's not going to do that, and he does. But um, I would say the probably the best and still the most intelligent and uh, all round is probably The Exorcist. You know, the first Exorcist is really good, with a, a great, very simple narrative idea. William Friedkin made it all work because to even make a film which begins with a film within a film is very dangerous and tenuous but he made that work he made the Irish director work and then he made the star living in her house in Georgetown work and he took almost the unlikely by making it real make it stick I, th I think it all in all is still one of the best there are many versions of that that's the problem People settle for less, but then we have to make films. I was trying to figure out who these people were in the spaceship. I mean, what was the spaceship doing out there, and who were the people on board? So I was looking for something different in order to break the audience's mental mold. I was doing everything I could to forbid the audience to think of this as just a space movie because I wanted the, to isolate them. I wanted this terrible sense of isolation, so you just knew that you weren't going to get help from home at all. And I had this line, you remember I had the line, uh, every time somebody would say something, would say, right, right. You know, they were yelling, yapping. Would say, I, so we're doing a scene, one scene, where Sigourney says to me, he says, uh, Brett, why do you always say right every time he says something in the middle of the take, you know? And I said, why don't you go fuck yourself? <laughs> and they said, cut, and, <laughs> and uh, that wasn't in the script, of course. <laughs> and uh, I Tom scared, or the outfit, or one of the, I said, well, if he's going to change the lines, or <laughs> it created a big furor.
I think there's an uncomfortable uh, atmosphere to the scene where they don't, they know, they can't believe it's that simple, basically. When you see the film with a proper mix and big sound, you can hear a lot of very subtle sounds all the time. They're always there. So they're working on your paranoia. And I think these atmospherics are terribly important. Um, this is not score. This is just uneasy, um, almost organic sounds that make you feel uncomfortable. And you don't know what it is. Is it a system of... Uh, air conditioning is it the sound of the ship so basically Jimmy was asked to just design the whole idea of the sound of the ship other than just the usual big rumble but the big rumble is almost there throughout everything so here we have this uh, jocularity and uh, and Ash's slight watchfulness and the whole point of this is to play this as if nothing was going to happen at all but I don't think anybody realized what was going to happen, even the actors. I'm sure they didn't. I mean, they knew what was about to happen, but the way it happened was a, a shock to them as well as the audience, especially her. I remember coming in and watching Ridley set this thing up with John. So I had some idea of what the mechanics were, and I don't think anybody else, had, any of you guys, had gone in there now. No, they wouldn't let us. They kept us upstairs in those dressing rooms for Well, hours. I was down there watching it, and uh, the look you get on Veronica's face is the real thing. She mm -hmm. had no idea what was going to happen. Really used some rather uncomplimentary intestines of animals, I think. <laughs> well, there were huge buckets it. of awful around and yeah but what was there three cameras three or four cameras yeah this is then they rigged him serious indigestion going on here yeah the airplane food <laughs> <laughs> remember they had it they had the um the shirt slightly slip yeah and um yeah. and then they stopped it because it wasn't cut enough and they told me I get a little blood on my face and had an entire jet pointed uh, that out. That was yeah. the, the strongest, <laughs> vision, not... the strongest vision I had in the movie when I looked up and saw blood on her face. Yeah, yeah. They, they were out to get her. And then I thought it was for real. Veronica. All at once I thought... <laughs> look at this. Look at the look on Veronica's face. I love this. She was saying, what am I doing here? That, yeah, right in there. That's... Whoa. Whoa. It's those no, little I'd... teeth with the little projectile. Oh, the smile, yeah. yet. I'm a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> that Ian. And then remember, it was the guy on the skateboard underneath that table. Yeah. With a cut in the table. And then they had him on a dolly, and they whipped him out. Yeah, yeah. It was just, it was like simple stuff, but it just looked so... Uh... Strongest vision I had in the movie when I looked up and saw blood on her face. Yeah, yeah. They, they were out to get her. And then I thought it was for real. All at once I thought... <laughs> look at this. Look at the look on Veronica's face. I love this. She was saying, what am I doing here? That, yeah, right in there. That's... Whoa. Whoa. It's those no, little I'd... teeth with the little projectile. Oh, the smile, yeah. yeah. I'm a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> that Ian. And then remember, it was the guy on a skateboard underneath that table. Yeah. The cut in the table. And then they had him on a dolly and they whipped him out. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, it was like simple stuff, but it just looked. <laughs> Anybody want to say anything? Again, Jerry's theme, which tells us there's more, is threatening and somehow chilling, chilly, beautiful, and elegant. I think O'Bannon and I, I know Ronnie adored it. I'm not sure about Dan, but I always wanted Dan's approval. I thought Dark Star was really amazing. Yeah. Very humorous piece. Yeah. Brilliant. And uh, that was directed by John Carpenter. Dan had written that one. 
Dan had got involved in some other directing process. I know Dan's deepest, most, innermost dream would have been to have directed this movie, right? And therefore, I felt, A, the fact that he was relieved, because oddly enough, he really loved The Duelists, which is really strange, because he's a science fiction fanatic. And um, I wasn't. So whoever chose me to do this was is bizarre. You I, you chose yourself. Well, I just read it. Yeah, but I was, fifth. I was fifth in line. Oh, I, I was the fifth or sixth director. You mean other people had turned it down? Oh, yeah. I'll let you want me well, to name them. Well, that's because... <laughs> I know who they were. I'm thinking, wow, what a dummy. But also, I, I remember being a dummy, too, because when I read it, um, not knowing what the alien looked like, yeah. I just saw this big, like, gummy bear. You know? It would have been awful. <laughs> I know, it would have been. Yeah. That's why when I first met you and, and you said, what do you think of the script? I said, well... I think it's very bleak, and yeah. I remember the casting person, yes. Goldberg, yeah. kind of going, you know, like, shut right. up, stupid. <laughs> you mean other people had turned it down? Oh, yeah. I'll let you want me well, to name them. Well, that's because... <laughs> I know who they were. I was thinking, wow, what a dummy. But also, I, I remember being a dummy, too, because when I read it, um, not knowing what the alien looked like, yeah. I just saw this big, like... Gummy bear. You know? It would have been awful. I know, it would have been. Yeah. That's why when I first met you and, and you said, what do you think of the script? I said, well, I think it's very bleak. And yeah. I remember the casting person, yes. Goldberg, yeah. kind of going, you know, like, shut right. up, stupid. Right. <laughs> you're lucky. You're lucky just to be here. <laughs> but bleak's right, because that's yeah. what we wanted. Well, and once I saw the designs, yeah. it yeah. completely yeah. changed the way I yeah. thought about the script. Circus must have burned out. I was, of course, tempted to develop these characters up and give them, you know, full psychological profiles and, you know, personal problems and the whole panoply of character stuff that is always done by knee-jerk reaction in every movie and every screenplay, except for one thing, and that was that it bored me. I didn't give a rat's ass. I didn't care about their personal psychological quirks, except in so much as it had an immediate bearing on the situation at hand. I didn't want to stop and tell the life stories of these characters because I didn't care. I cared about the monster that was going to kill them. That I cared about. So I didn't do any of that in the script. I did none of it at all. Everybody really worked great in the process of a film that, in a funny kind of way, doesn't call for background and who's writing to who at home and how you're getting that information back to families and da 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 Because actually what it was is a B movie. Mm -hmm. It's seven little, what's... Ten little Indians. Or ten little Indians in the old dark house. And that's what it is. But I think what happened is we all elevated it. I remember when Yafit came in, Yafit uh, loves to kind of stir things up, and he came in to work one afternoon, may have been this afternoon here, and the English crew was very quiet and always very gentlemanly, standing back as uh, Yafit came on the set and said, uh, let's cut this quiet shit, come on, what's, you guys stand around, you don't do nothing, you just uh, black like gentlemen, and he, he really got it going. And finally calmed down. He got his blood circulating at that point. <laughs> and I was standing in the back, and there were a couple of Englishmen in front of me, and one looks at the other and says, Isn't it grand being English? <laughs> 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 He's got a point, man. Really. <laughs> oh, I think we're on to something here. Ah, oh, Jonesy, you, oh, it's the you beast, you. What the hell are you doing, man? It was a fantastic exercise, I think, for both of us, because... This was, I think, Ridley's second film, and it was my third. I'd done, I did two others before that. So it was all very new, and I don't think I've ever worked as hard as we did on this picture, the sort of hours we put in to do it. You know, we tried everything we knew how, all different ways around. The whole idea was to terrorise people as much as possible. And that only comes with, like, pushing people into a corner endlessly, going as far as you can go, but not going over the top. 
And yeah, I remember running the film in, I think it was in London, or was it LA, the Egyptian? But I remember running in London and, uh, and the film in LA, and I knew we had something really extra ordinary because of, mainly because of the reaction, not just during, but afterwards. Mm. There was this kind of stunned silence. And, uh, and I remember Harry coming to me, I think it was an Egyptian, and he's so sweet, and Harry looked at me and said, thanks for the close-ups, man. Oh, sweet. Yeah, and, uh, and he meant when he walks through and goes, here, kitty, 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 yeah. <laughs> which is great. Yeah. That moment you know he is gone. I know. But, but uh, he was very sweet, and, uh, and he and Yafet made this great duo, you know. And, uh, in fact, I think the whole, to me, is probably the best ensemble I've ever had. Now this is where I screwed up. I could, I could never play terror. I can play crying, I can laugh, I can cry, I can do everything but playing terror. And I didn't know it at the time, but I found out later how to play terror. And I didn't use it in this part. It worked, but I wish I'd have known it. You don't look scared, you just look like I've never seen anything like this before. Like, <laughs> that's all you have to do. Ew, there's the skin, it's shedding its skin. Something's up, Harry. God, these sickening images they got in here. <laughs> Disgusting. This is great sound-wise, too. When you just enter this, like, rainforest, with the rain and the dripping just surrounding you. Again, sticking to your guns, why the water? So I would just say, why not? Why the chains? Well, the chains aren't very high tech. So yeah, yeah, but you know what? You've still got to let things down, so it's still going to be rope or water. It's not necessarily electronic. So I had the chains dressed because the room looked a bit blank and I need the movement in there. How is it moving? I said, I don't care. Where's the water coming from? I said, condensation. Why the condensation? Well, because uh, something's gone wrong in the ship, but they can... It's not, it's not life-threatening. They'll put up with it. The clinking of the... Yeah, the chains and the... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the chains and the... Oh, yeah. Oh, Ridley. Ridley, and Ridley. the rain, see, like that, there's that, yes. all that moisture that's coming down. You wouldn't get that moisture in outer space, I don't think, but... You do now. That was my idea. Ridley loved me for that one. He took it, he lapped it up immediately. Yeah. <laughs> There's always this sense that had I made it too slow, it isn't slow. I think it makes it more tense. You know, something always is going to happen. This was always amusing. I couldn't get a reaction out of the cat. So I said, I know what I'll do it. So I put a board alongside Harry Dean Stanton and had a German Shepherd there and we just lifted the board. It was on a leash, so it never harmed the cat. But that's how you get that reaction of the cat that's basically going, what? And um, there, that's where it sees the shepherd. And Harry's trying to ignore it. Would I do this today? Um, not really. I'd be, you know, I'd still be going for the tension. I'd still be going for nothing happening. But, um, uh, but I think it works pretty well. Sometimes you look at these things and think, I want to cut, I want to cut a little bit. I think the only direction we got from Ridley was... I think the only direction we got from Ridley was... Do you remember that? That was the only direction he ever gave us, I believe. Which was enough. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
it's very hard to talk about editing. That's why I say this is very difficult. Uh, maybe you'll find other people can talk about it far more fluid than I can. But whenever I've talked about editing, it's, it's, it's people say, why did you do so-and-so? Yeah, I have to say it was instinctive. I did it because it felt right at the time. It's like if you're teaching somebody how to do something. You can't teach people how to edit. You can tell them what they can't or they shouldn't do. But then those rules are already there to be broken because we take tremendous gambles with editing. And I'm still, after all these years of doing it, endlessly surprised at what we can achieve with the same pieces of film played in different ways and, and, and tricked around. But saying why and how you do things, it's got to come down to the material you were given and obviously what you were trying to achieve. And then it's got to be an inbuilt thing. It's got to be your inner timing. And then, of course, that will work to a certain extent. And then your director will suggest built thing. It's got to be your inner timing. And then, of course, that will work to a certain extent. And then your director will suggest changes which you never thought of. And I hope that's what I do for them, is that with all the pressures that a director has, he doesn't have time to think of every variation on the scene. I spend a lot of time talking to directors when they're shooting so I know what they're looking for for the sequence so that when I come to put it together the first thing I do is to put it together with the takes that they like with the ideas that they want me to try and get across but in doing that I see other things and I hopefully bring that to their attention or I do it that way so that they can see what other ideas there are. And I think that's what my job is, to sort of take what they give me a stage further. Then we develop it together. Dallas, I'm right here. Okay. Yeah. We're in position. I'm just trying to get a reading together. The airlock is open. Okay, Ripley. Ready? And again, this is all industrial tubing and stuff. None of this we made. We just got the tubing, rigged it. This whole thing from here with offcuts to them is in a day. That's all I was given, a day. You have a day, and that's that. And I'm shooting with real flame and uh, a guy holding a light, lighting himself. There's no other light in here but that. We just shot. It's all great about Derek. Even on anamorphic, I just shot this as it, as it is. That's it. There's nothing else there. I still have that. And I'm shooting with real flame and... Uh, a guy holding a light, lighting himself. There's no other light in here but that. We just shot. It's all great about Derek. Even on anamorphic, I just shot this as it, as it is. That's it. There's nothing else there. I, still I see other things. And I hopefully bring that to their attention, or I do it that way, so that they can see what other ideas there are. And I think that's what my job is, to sort of take what they give me a stage further. Then we develop it together. Dallas, I'm right here. Okay. And again, this is all industrial tubing and stuff. None of this we made. We just got the tubing rigged. This whole thing from here with offcuts to them is in a day. That's all I was given, a day. You have a day and that's that. And I'm shooting with real flame. I want it to be the most straightforward, unpretentious, riveting thriller like Psycho or Rosemary's Baby or even the most brilliant B-level like Night of the Living Dead and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But I want it to look, and I'm going to do this, like 2001. And I knew right then, I could have seen The Duelist. I knew he could make it look like 2001, but I didn't realize that he had that frame of mind that I'm not going to make this into a pretentious. I want it to play just like it read on the page. And then he said, we're going to watch together all the classic scare movies so I can get the rhythm of how scares work. Squeeze more out of an anamorphic lens than anyone else, you know? But you know, the advantage as an operator, when you're a director, is because you're seeing it, you know you're getting it. You know, you know what you're getting. So it's almost like putting your, the storyboard together in your head as you're seeing it happen. If you're not looking through the viewfinder, you're kind of insulated from what's going on. I mean, we're helped today by good video assist and everything, but there's nothing quite like being through the viewfinder and being close to the actor. You're very part, much part of it. To me, there's an entire logic to that, of operating and directing the same thing. 
I remember when Ridley met me, he said, I want it to be the most straightforward, unpretentious, riveting thriller like Psycho or Rosemary's Baby or even the most brilliant B-level like Night of the Living Dead and Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But I want it to look, and I'm going to do this, like 2001. And I knew right then, because I'd seen The Duelist, I knew he could make it look like 2001. But I didn't realize that he had that frame of mind that I'm not going to make this into pretentious. I want it to play just like it read on the page. And then he said, we're going to watch together all the classic scare movies so I can get the rhythm of how scares work. And we did that. We made a list and we all, Ridley and I and Dan O'Bannon, we all watched him. And I knew from when he even said that, from that first meeting, I knew that he was going to do just the job he did. I was a bit nervous about these flamethrowers. We were assured they were safe. And of course, the actors were taking off and practice with them. But I was always nervous about them, the uh, liquid fuel, and I didn't like them at all. We were very careful and cautious about everything. So fortunately, there were no accidents. But I do not like playing with fire. I was stuck on one point, which was once they got the thing on the spaceship, I wanted to avoid the cliche of bullets mouncing off of the thing, the indestructible monster. I mean, that's the ancient cliche, right? You can't stop it. Bullets won't stop it. Not at all. I wanted the thing to be, in every respect, a natural animal, which means, yes, if you shoot it, it'll die. So the question was, in the second half of the movie, why don't they just kill the thing? Why don't they just squash it? Right? Stick a knife in it, whatever. And I wasn't sure how to achieve that, and I had asked Ron Cobb if he had any thoughts. Ron Cobb, I remember, who was always helpful, said, well, suppose the thing bled acid that would, like, burn through metal. I said, great. I said, then they couldn't kill it, because then it would, uh, its blood would eat a hole in the bulkhead, and the ship would lose all of its oxygen. I said, great. Oh, look at this. This is the other guy gets it. This damn fool. Okay. Harry, order me a beer. I think I'm going to join you soon. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he sang me a ballad. That's what it was. <laughs> That's why I couldn't shoot him. It's funny that they always used to amuse the hell out of me because you'd see the whole audience would, you get when you get a nice bump of 800 people all together, that really is gratifying. It almost becomes really amusing, actually. But uh, it is fun to do a thriller. I'd uh, like to do it again, but I need to find the piece of material. It doesn't have to be that sophisticated, you know. You, you can make it more sophisticated, really. Proceed with Dallas's plan. What? See, I am the only smart one. Yeah, we abandon yeah, this yeah. stupid ship and get the hell out of here. Yeah, the audience is nobody right listens. With you. The, yeah, nobody the listens. Audience is cheering did, you on. Why didn't you say that before they got to me? Yeah. <laughs> why didn't you bring it up earlier? Well, it's because because uh, whatever my character, Dallas and yeah. her, Dallas and her were having an affair, and that's why she wanted to. Yeah, yeah was, which they cut out. out. She yeah. was getting laid. So there you have it. No, it's using the air shaft. This is the bit where um, I wanted to raise the level a little bit, so Yaffet and I were a little complicit here and said I want to crank the volume up here and push him and be irritating, and uh, we got it. It was very good. And I know that, I mean, it was because she started out being very emotional and all of this stuff because of Dallas dying, and he just kept pushing her and pushing her and pushing her. And I know Ridley was saying, get her, get her. And so when he gave that whole speech and he slams down his thing and he walks off the set again, she was so pissed off, which was what the movie needed. I mean, she had to just take control of that ship. She couldn't be a wimpy person. I was the wimp. Um, you know, I was the only sane one, but I... I think he did egg us on. <laughs> Relationships would be discouraged. You know, the idea of casual sex would be normal for obvious reasons. I thought, why not? Because if you've got seven on board, somebody's going to get left out, right? And so casual relationships, whether it's male or female, male with male, female with female, seems to be okay in space um, when you're 
locked away in a big tin can for years on end could be years plus hypersleep um so it might feel like a year you might be away 10 years um i called the russian spy there's a tendency in certain types of thrillers when people are on an interesting mission to stick in a russian spy one of them is a spy and they don't know which one he's trying to screw up the mission i called the russian spy there's a tendency in certain types of thrillers when people are on an interesting mission to stick in a Russian spy. One of them is a spy and they don't know which one he's trying to screw up the mission. Fantastic Voyage had that. When I saw Fantastic Voyage, I found it annoying. You're just about getting ready to head off into the uh, body of this person and have this fantastic mission to go through his bloodstream, get to the brain and save him. When you're informed that one of them is a Russian spy and he's going to uh, stop the mission from its completion. And instead of it adding any genuine suspense, all it did was annoy me and made me think, oh, I see, so maybe now I don't get to see the general idea of what constitutes a suspense story was an, was an issue of some contention among the producers. And I lost a couple of those battles. There was no ash in my original script. They added that. The idea being here that all, all scripts must have a subplot. Simply to have a single plot by itself is inadequate. All stories must have subplots. So they created a subplot. Ian Holm gives a brilliant performance. It's brilliantly directed by Ridley. But if you stop and think about it, if it wasn't in there, what difference would it make? One way or the other. I mean, who gives a rat's ass? I mean, so somebody is a robot. It annoyed me when they did it because it was what I called the Russian spy. There's a tendency in certain types of thrillers when people are on an interesting mission to stick in a Russian spy. One of them is a spy and they don't know which one he's trying to screw up the mission. Fantastic Voyage had that. When I saw Fantastic Voyage, I found it annoying. You're just about getting ready to head off into the uh, body of this person and have this fantastic mission to go through his bloodstream, get to the brain, and save him, when you're informed that one of them is a Russian spy, and he's going to... Uh... And I didn't know Cockney, and I thought, hmm, my hooter. Um, and so, luckily, when we got downstairs, <laughs> it was up my mouth to choke me, but it was funny, it was one of those things. Uh... And I didn't know Cockney, and I thought, hmm, my hooter. Um, and so... Luckily, when we got downstairs, <laughs> it was up my mouth to choke me, but it was funny. It was one of those things. You know, I didn't actually think, well, Ridley would never do that. <laughs> exactly. But I figured this, Nothing would have surprised me. Exactly. I figured robots had to have, if they're really sophisticated, had to occasion... It doesn't do anything except provide um, finger exercise for the writer who thinks that all stories must have subplots. So I, I think it's an inferior idea of inferior minds, well acted and well directed. Unfortunately, it occupies little enough screen time that it doesn't disrupt the main plot. But I thought the Ash thing was interesting that Ash was an implant of the corporation having a robot on board. Yes. So instead of just having a spy, you've got a biomechanoid mm. human being. Who can't be one over to the other side because he's been yeah. programmed. It's yeah. a very modern idea. Yeah, very Still modern. very relevant. <laughs> Has a formidable memory, so he yeah. doesn't even need a computer. It all goes in, and it'll all spout out later. I thought that was a great... That was mm -hmm. a first. Yeah, yes, thought, yes, yeah, That's yes. a really good idea. Makes sense. You said, well, come on downstairs. It's going to be great. Ash is going to pick up this sex magazine and he's, he's going to stick it up your hooter. And I didn't know Cockney. And I thought, hmm, my hooter. Um, and so luckily when we got downstairs, <laughs> it was up my mouth to choke me, but it was funny. It was one of those things. You know, I didn't actually think, well, Ridley would never do that. <laughs> exactly. But I figured this, Nothing would have surprised Exactly. Me. I figured robots had to have, <laughs> if they're really sophisticated, had to occasionally have the urge. So I'd said to Ash, how do you feel about sexual drive? He said, great. <laughs> so I said, rather than just beating her up, isn't it more interesting 
that he actually has always wanted to. And here's his opportunity, but he doesn't have that part. Oh, he doesn't. And therefore, it's a magazine. Ah. I didn't understand the Freudian overtones of the scene. I hope there aren't any kids listening to all this. <laughs> well, if kids can watch these it's movies, they can hear this stuff. Exactly. This is a great turnabout in the story because really just when you think that your main and only aggressor is this thing loose on the ship, you've now got a much bigger problem. You've got two aggressors, which raises the paranoia and that of the audience twofold. Always useful at this moment when you're about three quarters of the way through. So also suddenly the drops of milk made logic, because instead of it has spurting blood or fluid, I decided to have spurting. Didn't use milk because it would stink in no time, so it was just basically coloured water. But considering all things um, and the budget involved, it, we just thing to eat, and he's got his head in the middle of a table, you know, with grapes and all sorts of stuff hanging off his head, and then he. Uh, he shouts cut because he didn't like the silver ball. So the, what you see is Ian went back months later and redid it. But I, I loved his ideas. He, Ian had this twitch through the thing, which you don't get to see very much. He had like, he starts out fine, but as he starts to get, why this left eye would like twitch all the time as he starts to break down. So now we're probably trying to work out, or you know, you don't have to explain it that Kraft has have droids on board. You know, big corporations. Maybe the rumor has always been from the big corporations do to be looking odds and ends, and they also change the dialogue. It wasn't what it was originally. Well, that whole thing about how when nobody bothered tried to, to communicate with it, I mean, maybe if we gave it a chance, it was part of an experimental program, which in a weird sort of way didn't make him as evil. Originally, this is where he had brought up, has anybody tried to communicate with it? And we were all standing around and, you know, and listening to him, and he was so touching when he was doing it. And, and then Redley shouts, cut! Because he had milk and he had grapes and he had little, he hated the little silver balls that were like on the. So here we are, we're all like sitting there with bated breath listening to Ian, who's got his head in the middle of a table, you know, with grapes and all sorts of stuff hanging off his head. And then he, uh, he shouts cut because he didn't like the silver ball. So the, what you see is Ian went back months later and redid it. But I, I loved his ideas. He, Ian had this twitch through the thing, which you don't get to see very much. He had like, he starts out fine, but as he starts to get, why this left eye would like twitch all the time as he starts to break down. So now we're probably trying to work out, or you know, you don't have to explain it that Kraft has have droids on board, you know, big corporations. Maybe the rumor has always been from the big corporations do out of paranoia for their own investment of the huge craft and the cargo and the knowledge always plant a spy within the crew on board just in case they, the crew decided to go off and sell it to somebody. And therefore they always have their own security blanket as part of the crew. And he, of course, is one. I think that was a no really nice idea a new idea which uh, then gets used again and again and again and again, you know. And Sigourney was a, a revelation was because on the set, she never seemed to be acting much because she's reflective. It's all behind the eyes. And these guys are all the, surrounded by the best character actors in the business. And we thought, gee, is she going to be any good? She's not acting. She just seems... And every time we look at the dailies, though, we say, she's great. How come she looks so great? Because it was always, it's behind the eyes. As Orson Welles once said, we was watching Gary Cooper shoot his... You need more light to push through more glass. So 
it uh, sounds like all downside. And in these days it was because we had a lot of focus problems in this because we were kind of low light level right on the edge. So that means you're low light level and being right on the edge. You're, wide, you're approaching wide open, which is not good for the lens and clarity. So if we had a bit of focus problem, you know, you can use the loss of depth of focus on anamorphic, which is a thing in itself. It's part of the characterization of the kind of style you're choosing or the, the story you're telling. Just the remains of a helicopter there, just sprayed gold. Uh, jet engines there, spread, turned on end and sprayed gold with gold foil on them, just to make it look more peculiar of style you're choosing or the, the story you're telling. Just the remains of a helicopter there, just sprayed gold. Uh, jet engines there, spread, turned on end and sprayed gold with gold foil on them, just to make it look more peculiarly um, high tech. This is where you get the nice flares on the glass like that from anamorphic. Again, silences, silences. Being with the actress or the actor, where you can literally be right there with him if you're hand holding the series. How you doing? Veronica was always great at controlling barely controlled terror, catatonic terror. She's always like two steps from a heart attack, which I think she finally does at the end have a heart attack. It's fantastic, you see, the time you take over everything. This is what makes this film so special. And when it happens, it's like that. It's over. A producer who is a writer. This was uh, anamorphic. I wanted widescreen. Perception of widescreen is, feels like it's bigger. Then gradually they developed into the idea of Super 35, which is the, th the big difference with anamorphic is you're using anamorphic lenses, which means there's more glass on the front of the lens, which means that the picture quality is not as sharp. It means you need more light to push through more glass. So it uh, sounds like all downside. And in these days it was because we had a lot of focus problems in this because we were kind of low light level right on the edge so that means you're low light level and being right on the edge you're wide you're approaching wide open which is not good for the lens and clarity so if we had a bit of focus problem you know you can use the loss of depth that is a clue the cat wow going inside is a clue people were convinced that the Alien was now inside the cab. Uh, jet engines there spread, turned on end and spread gold with gold foil on them just to make it look more peculiarly um, high tech. This is where you get the nice flares on the glass like that from anamorphic. Again, silences, silences. Being with the actress or the actor. You can literally be right there with him if you're hand holding the series. How you doing? Veronica was always great at controlling barely controlled terror, catatonic terror. She's always like two steps from a heart attack, which I think she finally does at the end have a heart attack. It's fantastic, you see, the time you take over everything. This is what makes this film so special. And when it happens, it's like that, it's over. It's over. Here, boy. Again, would I buy Jonesy today? I didn't even think about it in those days. I thought, why not? You know, you have a cat. She'd be attached to the cat. Like, I've got dogs. I'd do anything for my dogs. Would I go back for my dogs? Absolutely. The air condition going, the, the little fans working. So you have airlines of people blowing things. So everything's moving and bouncing. And then there's a useful thing here. Again, a useful shock is coming up. That was very useful at this point and um, very simple, you know. Just have a guy prop and push it forward with his feet. It's not none of that. Bink, just somebody there pushing it forward. That is a clue. The cat wow going inside is a clue people were convinced that the 
alien was now inside the cat. Yeah, but it's so good as he's so intense. So I've been waiting 15 years for something like this that I knew would become amazing, all-time great movie. Before we even started shooting. Can you imagine that? What great vision? First day I met him, he said that to me. Yafit is the one who keeps telling me to move, but I can't really move when I'm between him and the alien. And here he comes. See, now this is the thing. He's like fascinating in a weird sort of way. Look at him. He's like looking at me. He's like checking me out. So I was going off of the fact that I would end up in a locker somehow. But obviously he's, he's doing other things to me. Balaji, who played the um, alien, he was just amazing. I mean, he was this graphic artist that they found in a pub, and he was seven foot tall, and he was Maasai, so he had very long limbs. So actually, that suit fit him. But he'd walk around in these white sneakers, and Tom was the one who actually said, this poor guy can't sit down, and they built him a special swing. Because he couldn't sit down once he had that tail on. And I always remember Ridley wanting to do, and there is a shot of it, you see the head and the brain. Well, that was maggots. And they wanted to stick that on Bellagio's head, and he goes, I draw the line. See, that was, that's Harry Dean's legs. Because I wear white pants and cowboy boots through the whole thing. And that was taken from the scene where the alien comes down in that warehouse thing. Now, they manipulated the film so they don't look blue, but that's not even the grating that's on the, the floor. So I remember the first time seeing this with an audience, and then, of course, the reporters, they go, and how did it feel? I said, I don't know. Why don't you ask Harry? I was so pissed off. I mean, years later it works, so it's fine, but I think they could have warmed me. But you see, this death scene, it was never completed. Originally, what I was supposed to do is crawl away, and I basically die of fright in the locker. And it was supposedly the same locker that Jones had been in, but that was uh, never shot. And um, I kept asking when we were going to finish the scene. Cause, I mean, the next thing I knew, they were on to something else. I mean, we didn't know how she died, but uh, the implication that there was a kind of you know, sexuality to this androgynous male-female who could give birth itself, but it could also impregnate. So it's like, uh, there are insects like that, so we're based that on, uh, you know, a little bit of good old Mother Nature. And um, was that some dreadful ending? Was that some terrible invasion of her body, a rape? And therefore, would there be a version of the Cartwright character? There would certainly, whatever happens, there'd be more humanoid aliens now on board this craft, and that's what she's now got to destroy. That's one of the difficulties. You now go, go again into this genre and then think of something that is, you know, equally unique, and it's difficult. You know, I just fell on Giger at this moment, who hadn't been seen that much except in Switzerland. Um, had a following, actually, at that moment, but he was just perfect. The, you know, right elements came together at the right time. to say, if you don't see something, it's it's your imagination. Because I did the birds, and um, there was this scene with the jump. I used to say, if you don't see something, it's it's your imagination. Because I did the birds, and um, there was this scene with the jungle gym and all the birds on the jungle gym. Well, a lot of them were cardboard, and a lot of them were real. I said, well, aren't people going to know? And he says, well, no. Your eye sees something, and it's your imagination that makes you believe that everything is alive. And it's the same thing with this alien. I mean, you're sitting there, and after a while, you start looking at the tubing and stuff to see if it's going to be coming out. And then all of a sudden, it comes out like this, and you go, shit, I didn't see it there. I mean, it's like it becomes so much more terrifying than having something that you can blatantly see. And I think that's where the other ones have 
sort of gone off and you just sort of lose interest. I mean, because you're not being a participant anymore. You're not using your imagination to create things. I mean, this was the first time that there were people weren't anymore. You're not using your imagination to create things. I mean, this was the first time that there were people where each character somebody could get involved with. And I was worried because I seemed to cry through the whole thing. And they said, no, you're the audience. You're the one who's reasonable. Let's get, you know, out of here. So I guess it, it worked, obviously. I mean, they've done four. So I, I think it was probably a very good formula. You know, the thing about a film like this is this is a lot of perpetual demonstration of heart-stopping terror. Because if the actor can't give it to you, then the audience ain't going to feel it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And eventually the wear-out factor on the beast will wear out. That's why I always kept it to minimal, like the shark. Mm -hmm. The less you see, the better. Absolutely. And to you, then the audience ain't going to feel it. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And eventually the wear out factor on the beast will wear out. That's why I always kept it to minimal, like the shark. Mm -hmm. The less you see, the better. Absolutely. And uh, so there's a lot of stuff. And I always remember in watching the end of a big mix, the big mix, thinking, good God, there's 17 and a half minutes at the end of this movie where Sigoni has no dialogue, just a lot of physical stuff running around in a constant state of catatonic terror. Right? That's my best thing. <laughs> <laughs> No, but it's hard, isn't it? I loved that part of it. I loved, I loved the the character and just doing it all with images because I think yeah. it, it emphasized her loneliness, her isolation, right. and the fact that she, you know, she could have talked to her cat, I guess. But um, I, I loved that. I thought she couldn't even speak or communicate with anyone. It made her more vulnerable. I thought. Yeah, but it's hard. It's difficult for as an outsider looking in. Because that's what my job is, to look yeah. in. I always thought, uh, I was actually full of admiration for what you did, particularly through that whole process, because that's an area in the film that can easily become two-dimensional, mm. right? And I think we, you got somehow, you added two dimensions, so we had four dimensions going there. I always thought that was great. This is trying to run behind her with a Panavision camera is murder. Or in front of you, running backwards. And uh, my focus puller this moment was Adrian Biddle. Don't you just hurl yourself down the corridor? You know, I really like the performance of the light here as well, because you, you're just using flat, flat on strobe lights here. I'd love to get stills off this actually. It just it was like a bolt of lightning when I realized that the audience didn't have to be told. What I realized then was that if it was difficult or artificial to tell, then it shouldn't be told at all. That the only things that the audience should be told in terms of exposition were things that were natural and easy for the characters to be speaking about. And that if it was not natural and easy for them to be speaking about these things, then it shouldn't be in there at all. And this is a principle of exposition that I've used ever since. Not just in dialogue, but in general. Any time that I find myself explaining something in a screenplay, and it seems forced or unnatural, that's when I stop and say, ah, that's because it doesn't need to be told, it shouldn't be told. If it belonged in the story, it would emerge naturally. If it doesn't emerge naturally, it shouldn't be in there and it's just gonna sound horrible. Didn't matter what they were doing out there. Who gave a honk? It mattered to the, us, the filmmakers, it mattered to me, the writer, so that we could create a plausible world for these people so that you could perceive them as real people in a real situation with a real history. Now, the film was meant to be over when she goes inside. Uh, you take off, you do the signing off. Now, clearly, you cannot end the film here. Even 
it would emerge naturally. If it doesn't emerge naturally, it shouldn't be in there and it's just going to sound horrible. Didn't matter what they were doing out there. Who gave on set? Which is, you know, only firewood. Okay, so this is all designed as the end of the movie. So there's a one megaton thing going to go off in a second. And graphic design, interesting, huh? Just a flat card, nothing happening. You just the sound and mixing between three cards. And I figure you've got to have two or three. But there's, we've got, I've got the wobbling down now pretty good. Nobody really wobbled the camera till this moment, you know, remember that? So I'm just really wobbling the camera. Bit unsure about the red ball. And score. There's a one megaton thing going to go off in a second. And graphic design, interesting, huh? Just a flat card, nothing happening. You just the sound and mixing between three cards. And I figure you've got to have two or three. But there's, we've got, I've got the wobbling down now pretty good. Nobody really wobbled the camera till this moment, you know, remember that? So I'm just really wobbling the camera. A bit unsure about the red ball. And score. Now, this would be the end of the film. I got you. But that, that's it, you'd do a signing off there. And I had to say, no, you know, you can't do that. You cannot possibly end there. You know, we made it for 8.6, which even in those days was I didn't cheap. know that, I thought it was 14. 8.6. <gasps> wow. Yeah, so at the end I said, I want to spend X to have give you a fourth act. How much? And I said, well, it'll take us four days. Four days? I said, well, you don't even know what I'm going to do yet. So <laughs> let me explain what I'm going to do. Then you'll go, how can you do that in four days as opposed to four days? I said, we're not finishing the film when she jumps in the shuttle. There's a fourth act. And they said, what do you mean? The film's over when she jumps in the shuttle, takes off, and bingo. I said, no, there's a fourth act in there which will change the way films are made. Because at, at, I think until this moment, it's almost fair to say, there's probably going to be some small independent film saying to me, you're full of bull. But, you know, today we've got into the idea now of uh, the end, then the end, and then the end. Mm, mm, and mm. by the way, here's the other end, yeah. right? And I always wanted to close the lid and then suddenly let it out again. Ba bam Okay? Yes. So when Ripley goes into that shuttle, there's a moment where you know the film isn't over where, when you're sitting in the seat mm. and the camera's craning up and Jerry Goldsmith does a really yeah. great little turn in the queue and that's where the screw turns and you can feel the whole audience who are now yeah. at this f first time screening, you could feel that they were like that. You could feel that screw turning there in the lid and you could feel people go, oh no, please God, let me out of here, which is yeah. a great thing yes, to have going. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> Well, I loved all that also. I'd done a lot of dance, so it really... I think so much of these movies is physical and sensory and, you know, to just be there with with the smell of the smoke yeah. <laughs> and everything, you know, it, yeah. it was it was so eerie and yeah. scary. And yeah. I, I loved that, the music that you picked and... Yeah. Yeah. What was the music? We used Tamita. Because oh. I said... I remember saying... Uh, we talked about this the phone. Because I was thinking... Whatever I can do right now, she's on her own, mm -hmm. right? So I said, I'd been playing with Tamita in the editing room as a temp track, a temp score. And he'd done Planets. And yes. one of them was Mar God of War is Right, right, Mars. right. Was Which we used a lot in uh, Alien 3, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I said, do you want... And I was very tentative about this, about suggesting it. And I was really amazed when it was, you said, absolutely, anything like that would be brilliant. And I said, look, I can organize, you know, half a dozen 15-inch speakers down the side of the set, and I've got this great piece of music, mm. which you may find extremely useful, because not, not only does it sound like engines, mm. it is extremely threatening, 
and ominous mm. and instead of uh, anything like that. What is it? Let me hear it. Bang, and we used that, but and it drove the sound guys crazy because everything had to be re-sounded. Oh, yeah. At that moment, I didn't care. No. I said no. There wasn't much dialogue. No. <laughs> And I, I remember asking you not to tell me what was going to happen yeah. so that I could be really surprised. Yeah, right. And I've always felt that the reason, I mean, just casting, as you say, Balaji Badejo, who is that, you know, his arm, his, my arm was like his leg, you know. I mean, he, he looked like he was from another world anyway, but when you mm. put the suit on him, it, it, was, it was stunningly beautiful as mm. well as being terrifying. Mm. And all you needed was that one gesture, mm -hmm. and it was so scary. We always wanted to make him intelligent. We actually wanted to have more of a yeah. sort of quasi-sex yeah. scene. And, yeah. and um, who was the executive at Fox in London? Um, Peter... Oh, yeah, Peter Beale. Peter Beale would yeah. only come on the set and give us a very stern, Germanic look yeah. and kind of look at his watch and basically said to you, you have two days to finish this or something. Mm. And uh, so this whole other thing, we wanted the alien to come and look at her mm. through the, the glass mm. and, and be intrigued by the, the soft pinkness of her compared to him. We wanted him to be that intelligent and that it kind of turned him on. Exactly. There was a moment that we wanted Beauty that. and the Beast, I exactly think we were that. going for. Exactly that, yeah. There is a, an appetite for a, a fifth one, which is something mm. I never expected. And, um, you know, I say, well, it's really hard to come up with a, a fifth story that's new and fresh. And, but I have wanted to go back into space. Um, I, I think outer space adventure is a good thing for us right now because Earth is so grim. And um, so we've been talking about it, but mm. it, very generally, yeah. It's a tough one, particularly the success of four. I think if you close the lid, it should be at the end of the first chapter. Mm -hmm. And I think very simply what no one's done is simply gone back to revisit what was it. No one's ever said... Where did well, it come from? Who's the space jockey? He, yeah. not, he wasn't an alien. Yeah. What was that battleship? Is it a battleship? Is it an aircraft carrier? Is it a, is it a bio-mechanoid weapon carrier? Not as was an aircraft carrier. Why did it land? Did it crash land or did it Practice. settle there because it had engine trouble? If those things have engines, everything has an engine. Or did he get the SOS? Exactly. That. And how long ago? Yes. Because those eggs would sit there. Sigoni said, I feel I want to sing something to keep me distracted. And, uh, she came up with You Are My Lucky Star. I thought, what a great idea. And then the powers that be back in the studio said, do you know how expensive You Are My Lucky Star is? But uh, that, that was it. I think it's nice, the idea of having her choosing to sing almost as a, an iron bar to hang on to her own sanity. Can you imagine if this was real? I thought it was a good idea, so we just did it. Yeah, there's a lot of talented people involved in that. Sigourney was great. And that's usually a man's part, and to carry it off with the strength that she has, presence, I, I was, that's very impressive. And a great statement for the women, too. <laughs> the women's movement. This is again a very good view of the alien. You, which I think you've seen very little snippets of him up to now, but and the danger is, yes, he's a man in a suit, but then it would be, it would be a humanoid version of an alien life form. Oh, wow. This is the most vulnerable moment for the way the alien looks. Bang. And that's the half the ship hanging upside down. It's a stuntman called Roy Scammell. 
And they're saying, yeah, but how are you going to do the engines? And I said, water. He said, what do you mean water? I said, make a ring of water, over crank it all, and it will look like plasma engine. They said, what's plasma engine? I said, I have no idea, but it sounds good. And as far as I'm concerned, it looks like a plasma engine, and that's that. But that's just water with an arc above it, obviously at a safe distance. So when the water comes on, it's rings, the lights go on as well, and you get a sense of jet power. Well, we wanted to linger on the demise of this creature as long as you possibly can. If you just had it with her blasting the engine and shoot him away, it would have been over and done with. And there would be no satisfaction for her that she got rid of it. So you have him struggle to stay in there. But when he goes, he then goes again and again. And if you could have done it three or four times, I think it would have just held anyway. You just wanted to see this thing going forever or hopefully. I should reach the frontier in about six weeks. Love all these oblique references to frontier in six weeks and you don't really know what the distances are. You don't know how long, what six weeks means. How long is she going to go to sleep for? But either way, she's going to go into a hypersleep and go into hibernation with Jonesy. Come on, Cat. Would you ever want to go back to where they came from? Oh, I, I think you have to. I think that that's the question I've always asked no, myself, no, no, is no. what kind of society are yeah. they if they are one? Yeah. What kind of world do they come from and why did they leave? Why did yeah. they send aliens out? It's entirely illogical that we are the only people in this galaxy. I think so too. It's entirely illogical it would that we're be not. So there disappointing more. and exactly. ridiculous. Really. That's us? Yeah. Can't. But, but if you believe in the Big Bang, which is from that to where we are now, is such an accident of trillions of events to do the right thing so that you can sit right here is actually impossible. Mm -hmm. So a scientist will say it is actually the wand of God or it's a far more superior being that enables us to be sitting here. That's mm -hmm. where science and religion start to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Huh. I, I think it would be great to, to go back because I'm asked that question so many times. Where did the alien mm. come from? People really want to know in a very <laughs> visceral way. Mm. Well, I mean, it's it's become a, an enormous, I mean, on a huge scale cult film, you know. And, and I, you know, I think uh, the sci-fi freaks, I mean, it's a, it's a major, major movie, so. And, you know, I, I by chance, happen to be in one of the major scenes. <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the photograph they're always asking me to done is the actual birth itself. I almost have to put an arrow to say which is me. <laughs> Well, part of the whole thing was the fact that um, Ian's character, remember he, he asked us whether or not we ever tried to communicate with it? And none of us ever did. We just assumed it was big, ugly, and nasty. So no, well, nobody you, ever bothered to communicate with what, it or with try. The monster? Well, with the, the monster? With the monster. So it's like really sort of... Well, no, well, but it's like a problem, beauty Mary. and the we beast didn't, We didn't thing. communicate. It felt ignored. It got pissed. <laughs> The people, it well, wanted a hug. It didn't probably. look like something would be articulate in, Eng in English. <laughs> what are you talking about communicating? That's what, with it? no, that's what he uh, says. Did anybody try to communicate with well, Ian says that? Yeah, when he's a robot. The whole yeah. thing is nobody bothered to try to. Yeah, I hate Ian in this. <laughs> <laughs> nobody bothered to try to communicate with it. They just assumed it was, it was awful. Who knows? Maybe wasn't necessarily out to hurt us, but nobody bothered to try no, to see was, if it was any different. It was out to hurt us. Yeah, we should have cuddled him and pet him a little bit. You know. Anything that's got uh, hydrochloric oh, acid yes, it running hurts. through its veins is out to hurt. To get us. Yeah. But that was part of the whole thing. Well, that's all for me, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Should I go now? <laughs>